GIR Hall is the last uh, public, well, second to last big deal that we're going to have with the 375th anniversary of Citrus Incorporation. The final thing that we're going to do will be sometime this summer when we'll introduce the books that's being made about Citrus 375th. And of course, you all want to be the first to buy copies. Um, we'll probably have that down to the uh, Citrus Harbor Community Center, and it'll be a free thing. You can come in and get some food, cake, and buy a book. So look forward to that this summer. But this is the last official. Uh, conference that we have at the GIR Hall, and it's, uh, it's an appropriate one. We're going to talk about the Cape Verdean experience, and going to introduce a fellow teacher of, that I talked with when I was in the high school, Manuel Montero, situate boy, who's going to tell you everything he knows about it. Now, was, when we were planning this talk, I wanted to remind Manuel that he's not quite as smart as he tends to be, and I said, don't ever forget that the Browns came over on the Mayflower. <laughs> and Manuel says, yeah, well, the Cape Verdeans came over with Columbus. <laughs> <laughs> so that ended that discussion. <laughs> without, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Manuel Montero, who's going to tell you the story of the Cape Thank you for coming on such a, uh, what is now a good day, so I can leave the scrap that. No, it's not a good day, I just canceled the, the warning. Uh, I want to thank uh, Matt Brown for inviting me, I want to thank you for coming, and thank uh, Connie, and Ricky, and Ben, and my brother John, and Ken. I can go on and on, everybody in here uh, helped me, uh, all the family helped me. Um, it's uh, still a work in progress, um, but it, this gave us an impetus to come together to try to tell our story. Some of you may know it about 40 years ago. Um, it's only 1973. Um, you know, uh, but I, I, I just. Didn't, couple of years out of high school. But, uh, 40 years ago, there was a lot of concern in the town about uh, services being provided primarily to people with children. And the town um, rose up and demanded, the Cape Verde community rose up and demanded <coughs> services uh, to the children in, uh, in situate schools. Um, Superintendent hired me, then I hired Ben, and, and we had a whole team. We had a wonderful bilingual program that allowed us to do um, a, a ton of work with, with our children. Um, so, it is in that spirit that uh, we're here. We did a lot of this back then. Uh, the program's been gone for about 30 years. But back then, we spent a lot of time talking to members of the community, the school community doing things at the high school, so we had a lot of traction back then, and um, most of us left and took on other jobs, so some of that stopped. Some of it continues on, but it is uh, not uh, out there publicly. I want to read uh, this stuff. There are only two parts of this conversation where I'm going to read, but I just want to read this part so that it is, it puts this presentation and context. So bear along with me. Um, it's very hard for me to add with uh, this little piece, but uh, let, let me share this with you. The Cape Verde community has existed in town of Citra for well over 100 years. Some oral accounts suggest that there may have been some Cape Verdeans in Citra as early as the 1890s. However, we've not been able to find actual records, but we're still searching. Like most immigrant groups, we lament not having recorded our past. Cape Verdeans first arrived in Citroën as farmhands and laborers, working in local farms and performing other menial work. 
For too many years, their stories have been remained locked within the closed Capernaum community. For too many years, little if any written information was available for the general public to read about the Capernaum immigrant, immigrant story. For my family, many of you, uh, many of you are here today, uh, we were able to trace our family's presence and sister back a hundred years. Our mother and uncle were both born in 1916 here in Sichuan. Yes, I was friends. And they, it was either on, one was born in First Parish Road and another was born in Country Way. So not too far from here. A few years later, their parents brought them to Cape Verde. And a few years after that, their mother died, and their father left them in the care of his sisters while he returned to the United States. We have located census records placing my grandfather in Norwell on Main Street. We continue to try to find more there. He remained in contact with the two children, but never returned to his homeland. In 1956, my mother courageously traveled by herself back to America to reestablish residency so she could reunite with her father and plan to bring her family here. A year later, she was able to send to my father, and in 1959, after they purchased a home in Stockbridge Road, they were able to bring their seven children to America. As luck would have it, we arrived in situ on March 17, 1959, <laughs> giving us special status to the town's Irish population. <laughs> I and each, of, and each of my siblings remember fondly our first years in America. Our first days in school, our first taste of vanilla ice cream, and making our first friends. What we have all valued and are grateful for are the many members of the community who helped us in the first few months and years. Above all, we are especially grateful to the teachers and classmates who welcomed us with open arms and who helped teach us to speak, read, and write English. Many of these classmates have remained lifelong friends we are truly grateful for the excellent academic preparation provided to us, allowing us to pursue our parents' dreams. Over 70 years ago, a group of Cape Verdean immigrants sat in this very same room to have their pictures taken with some local Citroen citizens who took upon themselves to help them in their transition to their new life. I look this way because the picture is there. I, there may be there are others there, uh, so you, you can take a look at it. Sitting right here at the stage. If it were not for an old photograph, which is here, as I mentioned, I would not have imagined the scene. While I've been on a 40-year quest to learn more about my roots. I only recently became aware of this part of our connection to Situ. While it can be said that not much information was available about Cape Verdeans 50 or 400 years ago, it is no longer the case. Where 50 years ago, you would probably not even be able to locate the Cape Verde Islands on the map. Today, the Republic is recognized as a leader among developing nations, a leader and mediator in African politics, a leader in providing opportunities for global tourism, and a model for both sound fiscal management and stable democracy in action. Considering that it has been 37 years since Cape Verde achieved nationhood, much has transpired during this period, especially in connection with Situ. Of note, the Cape Verdean minister, prime minister, visited Situ about 10 years ago. The first U.S. ambassador to Cape Verde visited Situ in connection with his appointment. The first Cape Verdean ambassador to the United States paid a visit to Situ in the late 70s. Nearly 40 years ago, Situ was recognized for creating 
the first in the nation bilingual education program for limited English speaking <coughs> students. Today, English language written reading materials are plentiful, and better still, the World Wide Web is replete with information. Some of what we would like to achieve today is to give you some background information which together with contacts within the Citric community will allow for further dialogue to explore the unique relationships and connections which have developed in this town. The younger generation, American-born immigrants, call Citric their home. They've never been to Cape Verde. They think of it as a distant land, which it is to them. Some have gone and visited, but they want to contribute to Citric's future and are committed to owning a home and raising their children in this town. Following their graduation from Citric High School, many have pursued college and professional careers. And I will tell you, there's nothing more that they would like to do than to come back and contribute to this town. So, my apologies for reading that, but uh, I think I need to set the context here. So, I have my uh, helper, my nephew Richard, who will uh, control the, uh, the presentation. So what we want to do is provide you with some basic background information, uh, covering 650 years of history uh, in a very short time period. I want to present some slides to you that I took some 35 years ago, which could have been representative of the islands 150 years ago, to give you some context as to where uh, folks are coming from, and specifically uh, Pogo, and more specifically uh, the two main villages from which Cape Verde is coming. Any questions? Sure. Do you have any slides of what it looks like today? Yes, uh, we have. We will have. Actually, we have a video. So, so we'll be presenting my brother John, who just arrived last night from Cape Verde, uh, who uh, is uh, um, working on some business ventures both in Cape Verde and in Africa. Uh, uh, hopes to show some of uh, those videos, and we'll try to focus them primarily in both. I don't. Uh, I need. To, I'm going to run through this very quickly because I think what we want to do is get to having some uh, open dialogue and questions. I think it's important to set the stage for you. Uh, we, you've listened to some Cape Verde uh, modelers and color datas and uh, instrumentals. Uh, Cape Verde uh, music is, a, is an essential part of our culture. Uh, it is where we get most of our entertainment. Um, Connie will uh, talk about the Citric Cape Verdean families, and um, we will present some issues that uh, certainly uh, are forefront in your minds and, and others, um, and um, hope to have an open discussion. Uh, we have as much time as we need, uh, and uh, obviously if you have questions, we hope we will have answers. We may just have one question. So, <laughs> Ricky, next slide, please. Next slide. So, you, for those of you uh, who don't know, uh, these are the, uh, the Battle of the uh, Cape Verde Islands. Those in the, in the south are called the Sota Bandit Islands, and those in the north are called the Battle of Bandit. And the uh, Praia is the capital, and Sao uh, is the um, which, um, island of Sao, which is up there towards Amilcar Cabral International Airport. That is the international airport that one of the first that was approved um, for flights uh, following 9-11 uh, for meeting all of the standards. Uh, Ricky, next slide. Okay, so the uh, basic information, this is taken directly off the U.S. Department of State website, uh, so there's no controversy as to the information that it contains. There are 10 islands, 
population is about 516,000 people. It is also estimated that there are another half a million people, uh, half a million Cape Verdeans living abroad. Uh, about half of that number, 200,000, <coughs> estimated to be in the United States, um, emanating from primarily from New Bedford, but moving towards the uh, down the Rhode Island coast, down up in New York, and now even down in the East area, and then Cayman Islands, and uh, certainly um, Situ. Also, Boston is the new center, along with Brockton, which uh, between the two of them, I think we have at least half of the immigrant, if not three quarters of the immigrant population. Uh, the terrain, as you can see from some of the videos, is steep, rugged, rocky, volcanic. And for the people who rely on the soil for their survival, this has been a significant battle against nature. And we like to think that those of us who survived met uh, Darwin's uh, test. We, we are the fittest. The GDP has risen significantly since independence. I believe uh, around the time of independence, it was, which is in 1975, July 5th, 1975, it was about $200 per year. It's now at $3,157, the per capita GDP. Uh, economic assistance in, in 2005, um, it received 161 million from abroad, and uh, you can see the numbers there. If you look at the US, it's a major donor, uh, it's a major contributor, 62 million, um, followed by Portugal and the uh, European Economic Commission. The natural resources are uh, salt, pozzolana, limestone, fish, shellfish. Pozzolana is a a, a volcanic mixture with which they uh, submit. Um, the official language is Portuguese um, because it, the system in place for over 500 years uh, was the educational system was run by the Portuguese. Uh, Cape Verdean Creole was not allowed, but that is the language that was spoken in the home. So you speak one language in the home. You go to school, you have to learn a second language. When those children first came to the United States, and the reason why the Cape Verdean community here rose up was that when the program was initially uh, begun here in this town, the intent was to take a Cape Verdean student from Cape Verdean when they first arrived, teach them Portuguese, then teach them English which made absolutely no sense. So we, we find uh, among a group of people, there are others in this room, who basically said that's nonsense. We challenged the school committee, challenged the state, which the state finally relented and recognized the Cape Verdean language, Creole language, as a living foreign language in the state of Massachusetts. By the way, I just took a job with the uh, Department of Education uh, two weeks ago, so don't put that out of this room. <laughs> I was criticizing what they did. Uh, so, the uh, ethnicity, which is always on people's mind in Cape Verde, again, this is directly from the uh, U.S. Department of State uh, information online. It's 71% uh, mixed African Portuguese population, and 28% African, 1% European. Literacy rate is high for a developing country, 84%. Life expectancy has grown significantly, uh, up to 71 years, uh, notably Independence Day. Uh, it is a democracy, it has a president, prime minister, uh, has an ambassador for the U.S., ambassador for the U.N., there's a consul general uh, in Boston, and uh, there is an embassy in Washington. And in the uh, political scene worldwide, it is recognized as an incredibly effective, non-aligned nation. Um, and climate, tropical, 
to uh, see. Uh, Ricky? Yes. So, the islands were uh, discovered by the Portuguese uh, during the age of exploration, uh, 1460. And immediately, because of its uh, strategic location in the Atlantic, it immediately became sort of the center of world navigation. If you recall at the time, the ocean routes were being uh, explored. Um, so Cape Verde became a center from which that exploration took place. Also, because of its location uh, with the ocean currents and the um, uh, wind, uh, and as, you, as some of you have come to realize when you walk during the hurricane season, that's where the most powerful hurricanes start. So if it starts deep into the Atlantic, you don't have to worry. If it starts right over the photo, it's coming for you. <laughs> so, uh, so, of course, these were the first settlers. It was uninhabited. Uh, it served as a slave center, so there was trade between um, human traffic between Cape Verde and Africa. Uh, slaves would be brought there, ships would come from America, pick them up, and uh, sort of do the triangular trade. Uh, slaves, rum, materials in that, uh, in, in that cycle. Um, the, the population evolved immediately into a mixed race population. Later on, uh, it served as a polling station for the British. Uh, it served as a major port for the veteran whalers. Um, it has suffered numerous periods of drought and famine where significant uh, numbers of uh, people died from lack of water um, and obviously lack of food. Um, and it also suffered probably foremost with over 500 years of colonial neglect by the Portuguese. Uh, Cape Verde is our major immigrant group in southeastern Massachusetts. Um, you, uh, uh, if you go back uh, 30, 40, 50 years, you'll find that some of the largest landowners on the Cape, on the islands, were Cape Verde. The largest farms, because um, uh, that's what they knew best. They came, they bought land, they built houses, they farmed. And um, one uh, Connie will, will talk about uh, her father uh, and his contribution to uh, uh, that portion of our history. Um, so, coming to America um, was a critical uh, thing. It was, it was almost for, for Cape Verdeans in, in Cape Verde. America was where one could find all of the opportunities uh, for yourself and for your children. And, and the homeland was, again, stricken with poverty. So, uh, those who came initially were Whalers, laborers, farmers, factory workers, service workers. It's almost in that order. The Ricky Messler. So, the, very quickly, run through uh, historical highlights. Uh, now, I'm going to read one more thing to you. Uh, but in the uh, um, two, two things that pop out um, in uh, in looking at this to me is that uh, certainly the Portuguese had an influence, good or bad. Uh, it was engaged in nefarious trade practices. Um, whaling had its heyday, became, it is obviously now uh, 
not looked upon as um, good for the whales or good for the environment, or good for people. Um, we had um, one direct connection to Situ as early as 1788. And that direct connection um, involves uh, the ship Columbia, which was built in Norway. Um, and if you know the Situa history, Norway was part of Situa until 1888, 1888. And uh, so it, the ships would leave, normally leave uh, Massachusetts. And to head to, believe it or not, to head to Oregon, you would head west, east, follow the wind, the ocean current, and the wind trade wind route, uh, go across the North Atlantic to the South Atlantic to stop in Cape Verde, pick up more provisions, and then continue on south around Brazil and down further and around uh, Cape and then up the uh, west coast of South America and then to um, the, the north, northwest coast. So there is a um, 1788, a paper fell in early death, being part of that, um, unfortunate death, being part of that uh, experience. So let me see if I, if I can. Uh, a little bit of drink. I think my water is right here. And uh, see, see if I, Susan, can you go get that for me, please? Brought my mic so she can help me. It's in the, oh, oh it's out. Uh, here it is. I have, it's actually coming up uh, on the next slide. And I have a bit. So give, give me, uh, I just want to, Relate this to you. I'm quoting now from uh, a, a book by uh, Edward G. Porter, The Ship Columbia and the Discovery of Oregon. The, um, the command of the Columbia was given to Captain Kendrick, then 47 years old, and 33 year, 32 year old Robert Ray. Um, the combined crews of the two ships numbered about 50 men, one of them being 19 year old Robert Haswell, the only one in the crew who kept an account of voyages that survives today, and who came to dislike Kendrick. Another crew member was 25 year old Joseph Ingraham, a claimed Navy veteran of the Revolution, later captain of the Hope that sailed in 1790 to compete, to compete in the fur trade an admirer of Kendall. The oldest man of the voyage was Simeon Woodruff, who had sailed with James Cook aboard the HMS Resolution, <coughs> the famous third voyage around the world. So, the Columbia set sail from um, um, Boston, uh, landed in Cape Verde. Uh, there's some uh, concerns on board. Uh, there's a, a fight and uh, some uh, some of the crew members leave. Then, this is the part I, I want to uh, quote. Once they get to Oregon, uh, and this I'm taking from Wikipedia, if, if you can trust that, uh, <laughs> the crew encountered the large Indian population and the natives who were born. The next day, seven of these men were sent ashore in the boat with Coolidge and Haskell to get some grass and shrubs for their stock. The captain's boy, Marcos, a black fellow who had shipped at Santiago, one of the islands, accompanied them. And while he was carrying grass down to the boat, a native seized his cutlass, which he had care carelessly stuck in the sand, and ran off with it toward the village. Marcos gave chase shouting at the top of his voice, 
the officers at once saw the arrow and hastened to his assistance, but it was too late. Marcos had the thief by the neck, the savages crowding around, and soon dressed their knives in the blood of the unfortunate youth. He relaxed his hold, stumbled, rose again, and staggered toward his friends. But received a flight of arrows in his back and fell in mortal agony. Under attack, the crew returned to the ship in difficulty. Murderous Row, Murderous Harbor, I'm sorry, was the appropriate name given to this place. So, anyways, uh, I thought it was uh, uh, important to highlight that Sinchwitz's first connection with Cape Verde was to uh, bring a Cape Verde to his death. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, next. <laughs> so, the context we find ourselves in uh, uh, here is that we have we have a number of representatives from the Cape Verdean community here. Uh, what we have is a phenomenon where families are being reunited with families. The earlier families come, establish roots, send for family members, they come and establish, re-establish themselves in a community here. The not unlike what happens with every other immigrant community, whether it be the Irish, the Jew, the Jewish, the Polish, the Greek, it works the same way. One of the unique things, though, that um, I have found in looking at this is that um, we're look, we, what has happened is that we have a number of villages in one island, primarily Fogel, and we're looking um, at uh, two, two villages. You get up on Mount Pigate, but they're adjoining villages, and there are small offshoots next to the residents of Putin, that's about a lot of people, and that grows. But they're sort of all part of the same family. So we went through a period where what we witnessed was a, a, a community being uprooted from Cape Verde directly to, to Sitchin. Now, it you reunited generations of people, brothers and sisters, parents and children, um, in, in an incredible way, so that you end up um, seeing families trying to find homes near one another. It was an incredible time in the mid-70s after Cape Verde, Cape Verde gained its independence where it was allowed to, Cape Verdean's number of visas for Cape Verdeans were increased tremendously. So they, in the 70s, were coming uh, to situate in drugs. I don't remember correctly, I was looking at some of my old papers, I remember doing the census. I thought the numbers that I had come up with was that there were about 750 Cape Verdeans in town back then. Um, it has significantly reduced, primarily because it doesn't have jobs, it doesn't have public transportation, and um, the jobs and public transportation and housing are brought. So now you have a split of families, you have uh, those that were connected were the earliest immigrants have homes in situ, but their brothers and sisters have homes in, uh, in Brockton, or Wayne in Brockton, but primarily uh, centered around Brockton. So, early immigrants. Uh, so, Ricky, when you get a moment, uh, sorry about halfway through, I'd like to put our slides on our phone. Uh, yeah, in, in a couple of minutes, so just said that. So, for Cambrians arriving in Sitchin, they weren't necessarily, the, the later ones were necessarily coming to a place where they didn't know uh, people. They're coming 
to be reunited with people that they'd missed for so long. Uh, so it wasn't as though they were coming to start afresh like the uh, early uh, families, but these folks are coming and folding right in. Um, the older uh, members of, of the uh, uh, immigrant population have actually, my mother included, uh, although she's among the earliest to be here, she's able to live within that community without needing to speak English, for instance, or um, learning or needing to learn the ways of, of, of um, this country. Which I, I should say, uh, I, I divorced my family from it, but I work with families where not making that transition, the cultural transition, the language transition, um, the per participatory transition, um, created a lot of issues, especially for young girls. Their value system is totally. Different. Uh, they would uh, see their peers dating. They would go home and suggest that they would date. And absolutely, you will leave the house. This is this is not right now. I don't think this was uh, early on. You will not leave the house until we pick your husband, or uh, you you find somebody we like. Uh, but no dating. No, and you don't, yeah. and if you do go out socially, you need to uh, make sure you have a chaperone of uh, life. I'm exaggerating a little, but that's roughly how I'm not. <laughs> so, so, anyways, uh, so the, the uh, all right, go ahead. I just wanted to. Uh, Stop so I can get a This is Fogo. Fogo is fire. I took these photos in 1978 uh, when John, uh, John, I thought it was on, I had arrived on the moon. I was sure. Who's that? Who's that? When I was taking these pictures, that nobody would believe me if I came back and said they faked the moon land. They have it right here. This is where they did it. I mean, it was, this is hundreds and hundreds of years of volcanic eruption, ashes settling down. The lava flows, not depicted much in the air, the lava flows go all the way to the ocean. And whenever there's been an eruption, it takes, this is stuck there for a second, I wish we could go back. The lava flows <coughs> take the choice uh, farming land because they're riverbeds and um, essentially uh, eliminate the possibility of, of uh, continuing with the animals. This gentleman here, is, was in situate for a number of years. His name is uh, Jim Pons. He was, uh, uh, I'd say, my father's best friend. Uh, very, very supportive of family, very supportive of those who are making their way to America, uh, but also forward thinking. He and my father sponsored a number of, of students on their own to study in, in Portugal uh, because they thought it was the right thing to do. Um, but these pictures, again, are all taken, these here are taken uh, at, right at the uh, foot of the volcano. And then we're going to go to, if you keep going, um, we will see some other, some other slides. This is, I can't, I believe this is the uh, John Drury Cup. Yeah, we'll get about, this is uh, uh, Cabo Villegas. 
This is a schoolhouse. Go back to uh, the Gator. Right there. That's kind of the Gator. Uh, that's uh, where the bulk of the population comes from. Again, these pictures are taken 37 years ago. It was probably a lot like this 137 years ago. But within the last uh, uh, 25 years, it's been remarkable um, uh, transformation once Cape Verde came. Okay, keep going, Ricky. Really. This is a, a schoolhouse that was just recently built. This is looking outside, um, right at my mother's house. Just uh, this is looking back at the village from uh, uh, heading over to the next village. This is looking down towards the ocean. If you can see the dryness, this again is uh, taken from uh, uh, my, my parents' house. This Maria is uh, towards your, your your family's house. But then you notice the structures, the dryness, the... Um, this is what, if you can imagine, okay, Brittany, you can notice that. If you can imagine leaving there and landing here, uh, and somebody saying to you, would you like some ice cream? Yeah. You didn't have electricity. You didn't have anything cold, never mind frozen. Here, have a taste. Or uh, going to school and somebody talking to you about things that you've never encountered in your life. Uh, snow, ice, uh, things that are commonplace. So those are things that uh, Ben and I tried to deal with and so the uh, Who's the director of the bilingual program here for a long time? Who, as a, uh, how old was I? I think 26 years old, 1976. So Ben, was that? Yeah, no, no, but, but it, this is a man who had uh, been a, a star athlete on the South Shore. Unfortunately, he played for my shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Who had done a full career in the Air Force as an air traffic controller. And he arrives in Citrus, he lands in a couple of jobs, and then I'm, you know, here I am, this little kid saying, it's 26 years old, in bed, I need you to come work for me. <laughs> And, you know, I, you know, and I, I didn't know the world. I didn't know the city. I didn't know Cambridge. And that, that was my life. So introducing Ben into that mix just opened eyes for, for the kids that, that, that he was working with. Yeah. So, How about that he was just entered into the Marshfield Hall of Fame? Yes. Uh, 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 I, I was happy to go. I was, I was happy to be there. <laughs> uh, he, uh, I didn't have to play against him because I don't want to say, he, although he's the godfather of my first year. Uh, ben uh, was, uh, what was it? He, he inducted into the National Hall of Fame just two years ago, a year and a half ago. Lucky enough to be in attendance, and he and Mr. Savelli uh, got to share a few times. Some of those of you who've been around a long time know those names. Uh, so. Do you want to tell the people there are seats available up front? You sent by All right. So let me uh, just, Connie, uh, I need to get to turn this over to you. I think you're aware of it. Uh, what's the next? So uh, let me uh, hit this quickly. Uh, I, uh, again, uh, we'd love to get into the conversation. But the immigrant, tapering the immigrant legacy, I, again, I can't imagine uh, what it was like 100 years ago or even 50 years ago to uh, pick up and leave your country without 
not only for language, but other language that's going to be a job for the new uh, on this side of the ocean. And for the most part, in the kill, um, there was uh, uh, air flight. You came by packet ship, or you came in a railing ship. A trip that took 35, 40 days from the time you left your village to the time you arrived here. So, adventurous, courageous, I don't think even uh, describes that. Uh, they're uh, generally in situ, uh, when you talk to people about these folks that are hardworking, uh, they hold strong family values, they don't just hold them, I'm sorry. They express them. They, uh, if, you, if you've been unfortunate enough to be driving at 11 o'clock on a Saturday and there is a funeral procession in town, you should stop and get yourself a cup of coffee. It is miles and miles apart because everybody comes together to support one another. So it's not just family, but it, it extends into extended family, community, and uh, The main reason why people need to come to America, you ask them, the first thing is they want a better life for their children. Education, education, education. So it doesn't matter. Um, you know? Yes, they always, we always, uh, lament taxes, 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 and they pay them. They're not creating a ruckus about the fact that it costs a lot of money to put kids through uh, public schools. If you befriended uh, Kate Bergen, you'll find that they are incredibly loyal. Uh, if you uh, witness their spending habits, they are very frugal. <laughs> this is a trait I should learn. Um, and uh, a sympathy. They certainly uh, will, or we will, uh, be friend and be helpful. And uh, again, if, if you uh, made friends with a Cambrian family, it, 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 you get their all. And also their nostalgia. Nostalgic about the home. We, we all want to go back there someday. When it costs you a lot. Ricky, next one. You left out one thing, you know, uh, terrible drivers. <laughs> <laughs> if only when they turn 90. Yeah. <laughs> I remember, uh, of course, the name, uh, Deleuze. Yeah, I didn't tell him to be Whenever I, I come up uh, in the harbor, it's like, should I follow him or should I go the other way? <laughs> no, he's, he's, he's going two miles an hour. So, all right. Um, so let me move, rip this through quickly. And Connie, we can talk about the kid and family. So the arrival of the earliest families, I mentioned to you, dates back nearly 100 years. Uh, the number of uh, arrivals were limited significantly by uh, the literacy test in 1917. Um, the elimination of quotas in uh, 1965 actually became the same thing. And then, in 1975, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you my, my side of the story. Uh, in 1965, there was this major overhaul of the U.S. immigration and it essentially allowed 20,000 visas to be distributed. 20,000 visas for each nation. So uh, Greece would have 20,000, Portugal coming in. It was geared more towards uh, uh, those uh, countries that involved, already had uh, immigrant presence here. Families being reunited. Somebody stuck in the law that if you were born in a country um, that was in overseas territory or colony of another nation, you were limited to 1% of that 
20 pounds. So Cape Verde, at the beginning of 1965, went to 200 pieces. So it was done on purpose. There's no question of that. In retrospect, people understood that, that was, uh, it was racially motivated to uh, make sure that the, uh, uh, the, the bulk of the immigration continued to be from Europe. So guess what happened? 1975, Cape Verde gains its independence, and guess what? 20,000 pieces are now available. So, so Tiny, um, when I stop there, you can um, pick up with um, um. the farming, and uh, we'll, we'll pick up with um, others. Uh, um. This one? Can everyone hear me? Okay. Well, because of the farming background, um, working the land was something that most categories knew how to do. And um, there were workers, caretakers, my large estate in situate, and most of the people would have a home guard to see their family. And many of the early arrivals worked on um, John Fitz in Greenbush, uh, James Jenkins, and Pick was young. I think that's what your grandfather. Um, they all own large farms. And in the 1930s, Domingo Wild and John Vega each had a business of peddling fruits and vegetables. They would go around to the Cape Verde family and sell their fruits and vegetables to them. Then we have John Andrew, who lived in the Greenbush here. And we have Benjamin Rodriguez. He lived in Marshfield, but he had land in Marshfield and in Situate. In fact, uh, one of his sons, Papa Rodriguez, still lives on the land on Summer Street in the West End. And he was mainly a truck farmer going into Boston to bring in uh, fruits and vegetables. Uh, also, we had um, John Andrews. In situate, the walls of the truck farm. And there was uh, Jane Quantos from Marshfield. He also was a truck farm. Also, yeah. Okay. Okay. And he's the one that went by some of the land. Yeah. Um, there were four enterprising men um, who had gardens, uh, and they decided to open a little farm stand. They were John Andrade on um, Stockbridge Road. There was Aries Rodriguez on Telvin Road. There was James Mendy on Country Way. And then um, and my father, who was out for gold. In 1945, he purchased land from Christine Vaughn and from um, Angelina Cole. And it's on Kent Street. And it became his part of mine. My dad worked for Judge Kaplan, which is, uh, Jim Longwood owns the property now. He was the caretaker there for over 25 years. And after buying his land uh, on Kent Street in 1945, after a couple of years, Judge Kaplan told him it might be a good idea for him to um, maybe move to Kent Street because he lived in a house that belonged to Judge Kaplan on 3A. So about 1947, 48, I remember that we moved to Kent Street. My dad bought a house um, in Coasset and had it moved down to Kent Street. And um, there should be pictures of the early stand that he built. 
and then later on, that was closed in. That was the uh, layer. Now the man over the top, okay, to the right, that's my dad of the bone. And the man on the left is his brother, Lewis. Who's the little girl? I don't know. They were <laughs> 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 The man with the hat is um, Jose Vega. Thank you. 
here anymore in America. And they put food in. And then the vessel went across the Atlantic Ocean to Cabo Verde. It's about 3,000 miles when you go, when you would go, well, a little bit here to go like this. <laughs> but when they arrived, you know that the family had some clothes and some food. But also what they did when they helped to hear in the cranberry box, well, then they went to the store and bought some lumber. Because in Cape Verde you don't have lumber. You heard about, you know, the dryness there. There are no trees. So it's the money they make here from the box. They bought lumber and they brought also back the lumber. You know what they did do with the lumber? They built the houses there because before they had just the big stones. But a little bit you like it to have also some wood. And so it was like this. So it's helped you here because the Creoles, they, were, they had the Protestant work ethic. And what they did, they worked here very, very, very hard. They took all the little money, bought something for their family, and then went back. But then they came back, and this was like, you know, you had to go a month this way and a month that way to commute to your work <laughs> in springtime a month over here. In fall, after the last berries were picked, you know, they went back. But I don't like to take all your time. I just like now to say, the Ernestina was teaching up to 6,000 students on board every year. And that was usually from March till November. In, in March, April, while we were picking the boat, we had the little ones coming on board. And what we did, we did everything, you know, to tell them what you learn in school is important. When they were older, you know, we let them take, uh, help us to take up the sails. And then they said, but you know, why we can't do that without any motor? And then we tried with the mathematics they had learned in school because they can, could use it. Oh yeah, there was a little girl pulling on one string and on the other, on the other side were four big boys. But they were the pulleys. And you know, they pulled very hard at the little girl, but maybe they didn't pull the big But that was applied learning. And that, I hope we can do it again. And in 2005, the gentleman that runs now for being president, he suddenly couldn't have given us 200 and something dollars, 200,000 dollars to restore the vessel as we get again our provision you know, so it could take out students. And so unfortunately, the boat is on the dock. What we had done, we had already raised, tried to raise as many different organizations the money. Now the front part to the middle is repaired, but now we still need the money for the other part. But we keep on fighting. And please, when they ask you somewhere, talk about her. Because they brought your people to the church. Can you um, tell them who you are? Well, they know what you do. <laughs> <laughs> I am Trouty Foley, and I was the anthropologist and the crew members. You see now my fingers there everywhere. But I was the crew member for 15 years on that boat, and I helped ready the vessel in the 1970s when she was still in the island. And we tried to have her in 1976 in New York, that she would have been for the 200 years in New York. However, when we left St. Vincent, the mask came down, and so we went back to the island. The boat was built here in Essex, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So I was saying, hey, you know, it would be so great to have an Essex schooner coming back to America for the 200 years. But we didn't make it at that time. And then there was a group in New, in the New York and Massachusetts, and, you know, in Arms, and, and everywhere. And they were saying, hey, you know, you have to bring that boat back. But there were other people, because she was before called the Effie and Morris, and there were other people. And they like it. No, we are the Bartlett boys, you know. We were on that boat and we are the rich ones. Yeah, that boat belongs to us. And the people were saying, no, this is one last one of maybe 250 boats that brought immigrants back and forth. 
And so they were fighting. And he put them in the road. Money and money and money. And then finally, the boat came back. But the boat came back as a gift from the people of Cape Verde to the people of the United States. And unfortunately, that gift was a little bit abandoned in 2005. And we hope they like to give it to us as a, as a sailing schooner, but not going out like this. No, as an educational schooner. <laughs> you just gave my slide. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry for that. My voice was uh, uh, weakening, but there is other stuff that we're going to talk about related to. to you know, I just want to ask that. Mm -hmm. This was 350th we participated in, and one of the things we had planned was to help the Uranusina commit to tissue problems, and we were going to have the launches take people out so that they could board it because they couldn't come in to the harbor itself. And right to the last minute, we had advertised and everything. They informed us that the Kennedys wanted to have um, an outing to take friends out. And they supported them. And they took the Kennedys and just ignored us. Uh -huh. well, let, me, uh, <laughs> yeah. let me tell you my Ernestina story. John is here. Um, let me tell you, we're lucky to be alive. <laughs> we're lucky to be here. Uh, first leg of our trip in 1959 in February. Uh, I need to see if they had any records in Cape Verde. We took it from uh, uh, St. Philippe to uh, Kaya. Yes, uh, what happened is when I did my research, I went maybe to 80 different places here in the United States. I spent over 100 days in Washington to do my research. And I'm saying, my God, you know why I don't go to Cape Verde? There you must have everything. And when I came in 1988 to Cape Verde, what happened there? They had no archive. And so one of my friends gave me his card. He was working in the government. And he says, you go to Brava. And so I took the card to Brava, and then I like to see the archives. Unfortunately, in Brava, they had a big hurricane in 1982. And everything, every roof had fallen off. And so they had just grabbed these, these all these documents, put them in a bag, and threw them in the back room that had a roof. Unfortunately, they threw also everything that was floating in the ocean. In there, there was a, a bag of old coffee and a bag of things. And when I came in there, there were these kind of sizes <clears throat> that looked me. There were the little animals that looked at me, and I think, can you go a little bit aside? I want to tell you, I didn't bring today the pictures. Yeah, I have here some other pictures. So if anybody likes to see some Hebridean pictures, I can show you some. But there were bookworms the size of my thumb, oh, oh, oh. eating craters into these documents. Mm -hmm. So I got involved in the foundation of the National Archives in Cape Verde. And there it was, I went from every island to every island, and I tried to find somewhere. Where you have the old records? Oh, there was a few boxes here, a few boxes here. When I came to Sal, I liked to go upstairs, and look where they had the old documents. And the guy held me aside and said, please, you know, walk on the side because otherwise you fall through the floor. <laughs> and I said, okay. And I said, so you know. And then I said, what do you have there up there? And they just said, oh, well, you know, there's nothing much. And I walked up and I said, may I go up? Sure. So I come up and there were patients lying here, bad ones, and so on. And then up. Up on top, between the rafters, there were the documents lying, but on top was the pigeon crap, and the pigeon on top, and sand. 
and all the salt and that the wind brought in and the sand was were up there because there was no window. Unfortunately, I made some photos of this and I tried to do some research in the area. This be a long story. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to say, and somehow I had the data documents that were after transferred to Cali. But there were some islands, for example, St. Vincent, they have now made their own maritime museum, but I have not yet seen it 11 years or 15 years later, there was still something up the road. Okay. Uh, Try the young guy here. Okay. Uh, Thank you. 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 Uh, something will happen. Let me, let me tell you my, my story. There's seven of us, uh, seven kids, and some others uh, got um, on the Ernestina in February 1959 to make it to Gaia so that we could get an ocean liner, so we could get to Lisbon, so we could get our papers in order and fly eventually to Massachusetts. Well, we, um, we didn't know we were going to make it alive. We ran into a storm and they threw us all down in the hole. And you can just imagine, we never been in a boat. You can imagine what happened. And luckily, the next day we arrived safely where we were going. But it was uh, probably the most traumatic experience of my life. The next time the Ernest thing that comes into my life is in, uh, Ben, I don't know if you were with me when we went down to uh, the UN with the American students, and back in New York, New York. We, we were with this gentleman called Michael Flatson, who is a uh, USA uh, uh, um, And we were collecting um, rope and other materials to fly over in a mass to fly over to, to Cape Verde. And uh, so anyways, we took two buses down and there was a, uh, a, an outfit, a marine outfit that has an extra rope and other materials and just come and pick it up. So I got two buses paid for a message from schools where, I, mean, I don't know how many kids I had on the bus and this is now at like 10 o'clock at night. So we just get to the UN and we're going to drive back home. So we, we, we pull up. Jed Fitzgerald went with me. He actually wrote about it uh, for a teacher. So we get the ropes loaded in. And then at about 4 o'clock in the morning, we arrive at Citrus High School. Two bus loads. Jed had a truck. And I'm wearing a white suit. <laughs> so I'm unloading. So you know how you're not supposed to lift. I pulled a back muscle that took me out of work for like four days. I thought I was going to die. Mm -hmm. so, so that's the other thing. The next time the other comes into my life is we're running a. Uh, we did. It's not. This is not on the website. We did a conference at SMU to try to build this whole concept of sail training. So, anyway, very good. Thank you, Tony. That was not planned, by the way. <laughs> okay. Oh, the, the one piece that we missed here, the reason why the ministry is important, probably the most important reason why it's here, it was owned by somebody from Situate. It was owned by Henry Mendes. It was purchased by, uh, uh, I forget the relationship, but we said, do we? That was his daughter. His daughter. Um, Mr. Mendy is in the picture. He's right here. Okay. So, so that's the connection. So it's not to so off the wall. He has a nice road that uh, has uh, uh, its roots in paper. You could indeed serve all of these functions that are here. Uh, and it's worth preserving. It is the oldest floating glossy schooner on the planet. 
So, uh, so let's let's move it on. Ricky, next slide. Um, this is a topic that is not usually discussed um, in in these settings. So, you know, I, you know I, it, it also involves. Uh, you know, some audience participation decisions. So, Cape Verdeans, if you go to, uh, you know, who are we, what are we doing here, when do we look, the way we look, how many of you are there in this town, um, why does one look this way, the other one looks that way, why, um, Aren't you really Puerto Ricans? Uh, you know, you know, where do you come from? What is all this? Uh, it's going to get a lot more confusing, so not, I'll tell you in a second. So, in Cape Verde, race is not a factor. It is not, you, you don't simply uh, categorize people. On the front side of the sheet of paper you have, there is a they are probably one of the best uh, explanation of who we are. Uh, we, we are a multiracial, multicultural people. Um, we came to America um, voluntarily versus coming to this place. So our whole experience, our whole view of life was different. We came. We went back, we made the decision to settle. As you know, Connie's mentioned, we became, uh, our, our forefathers became landowners, landholders, and it just worked uh, peaceably uh, in this part of the country. Things got a lot confusing, though, as uh, um, new arrivals uh, um, came. Um, after 1975, or between 60 and 75 is when we had the, the greatest period of, um, not necessarily turmoil, but, but confusion. The first immigrants came to America with Portuguese passports because there was no cable. Uh, so they were Portuguese. The Portuguese who came from the mainland wanted to have a separation. But we don't look like them. We're, we're white, we're European. Those folks are African, so they, they come from somewhere else. So, when they became a distinct, this, they began to distinguish from us. They were white Portuguese, we were black Portuguese. We were browns, because most people were, were from black. Then, in the 60s, most First generation Cape Verdeans, I should, I should say most, because a lot wanted to carve out their own Cape Verdean identity, but many decided to join the, um, the black movement. And so all of a sudden, and then there's this move, uh, there's this uh, independence movement going on, there's a lot of uh, Cape Verdean pride uh, being instilled in, uh, you know, there's more information coming. I will tell you, the reason why I said what I said at the start of this, uh, in 1972, I, 71, 72, while I was in college, a professor sort of challenged me um, do a research paper on Cape Verdean immigration. And I couldn't find anything. I couldn't find anything written in English. So everything I found was in Portuguese. So this is what I never wanted to do. Now I've got to learn Portuguese to then do the research, to then write something about what I researched. So I did end up as a romance language major. Uh, so I did major in French and Portuguese and wrote my thesis on the theme of Cape Verdean literature, um, the theme of emigration in Cape Verdean literature. So it, it just opened up a whole new world of information for me. But it stuck there. 
there are not many new documents, new books coming along, and all of a sudden, with independence, there's an explosion of information compared to the fact that there were, there's nothing available uh, to, to research. So, anyways, today there's an abundance of, of information. Uh, getting back to this whole identity piece here, is that it became quite common in, in different Hickorian families for there to be a division of why are you pursuing that route versus why don't you just, because the parents are confused. They, they don't know what's going on. You're Portuguese. That's the passport you brought to America with. You, you're not black. You're not white. You, and then slowly but surely, their movement in the Bedford in particular, there was a group called the Cape Verdean Recognition Society that spent a ton of uh, effort trying to educate um, the people about who we were and what we needed to, um, how we needed to come together. So it's, it's, it's a part of our history. Uh, the different things that we've done over the last 20 years, having a nation called Cape Verde, having Cape Verdeans come to America with Cape Verdean passports now, having Cape Verdean bilingual programs, Cape Verdean language, Cape Verdean culture. It's allowed us to gel into a more um, uh, defining uh, group, a more defined group. Now, we're at the precipice of another major change, some of which has already happened, but, but at this point, um, no, um, I, Susan, may I? <laughs> we are, we are uh, married to Susan Anglin, not a king for you. We have three children. <laughs> we have three children, two of them are married, one, two, I have spent one to um, Patty. And I've got two grandchildren. So it's like, you know, how strong is that Cape Verdean um, identity going to hold? So, not unique. It is, you know, every, every family in this room here is Cape Verdean is going to go through that experience. And it's, it's, it's going to be very important to figure out what that next iteration of, of our identity is going to be. So we're going to be part Caperian, part Irish, part of Penn. It, 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 it's, it's amazing. So, anyway, so next slide. Any, any, anybody uh, wish to comment? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Except for <all> that. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Well, I have a point of view on this. When I was a kid, and that was a long, long time ago, um, one of the questions every kid was asked is, what are you? And you either had to answer you are Yankee, or Irish, or Catholic, or Protestant, or the when I was a kid, there were no Cape Verdeans, as far as I knew, they were all Portuguese, is what we said. And uh, so everybody had to classify themselves to their friends. And that question was constantly asked. I don't think that question is asked as much anymore. I, I, I think that he asked them. What music do you like? They ask other questions, but I don't think he asked the question of, what are you? And said in that, with that chip on the shoulder, after, I don't think that's asked as much anymore. Maybe it is. From the south. What? Oh, unless you're from the south. You are always telling me you're not from around here, are you? They might be. Yeah, uh, yeah people, people still want to know what you are. But I think that, and I think it, it may have to do with, uh, with parts of the country. I mean, we talk differently here in Massachusetts, and, and uh, there are other things that divide us other than 
a country of origin and race. I, I really think we're not as divided as that may be idealistic. At least in this area, at least in Sydney. Well, I don't think we're divided any much as, as much as that we were when we were given. But that's my opinion. Any opinion on that? We all talk different the other people. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I, I remember the question, what did you, and the answer was, I just want to make something. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, yeah. That was, no, you, no. you had to have some sort of an answer ready, because you're going to get that question. I'm not sure you get that, but what do you think? I'm a model. Yeah, I think we are happy a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, as a teacher, I you know I know that it was in the early days. If you give your last name or you moved somewhere, it was what kind of name is that? Not so much what are you, but what kind of name is that? I don't hear the young people at all talking about what kind of name is that. And so I think you're right, man. I don't think that that's an issue for the young people. Yeah. And I I can say growing up as a teacher, I've always I, all my kids were getting friends and stuff. I never said people were black and white. And when I went out into like other places, people say, well, they're black. I'm like, no, they're not. They, they're pussies. <laughs> and I never, I never knew a difference. I never had a, I didn't grow up saying that those people are us or here. It was, it was because we all grew up together and we all went to the cultures of, of the Cambridge culture. It became part of who we were going out into the world, and we didn't see people. We didn't see, we didn't see people as you know. Well, your culture and that culture. You know, I just think that I helped more of other people's cultures because of what I I got here in Scituate. I got a quick story. I'll try to make it quick. When, when Manuel and I were teaching, I think we were in high school at the same time. Yeah. We this was during the the wild and crazy uh, black culture sixties, where uh, Rebellion was in the land, and so I, as an innocent young situate teacher, said it would be a good idea to have a weekend devoted to discussion of race. So everybody sort of went along with it, as long as I did all the work. And uh, so I contacted, I contacted the editor of the Cape Verde newspaper. I contacted a, a black revolutionary in Boston, Roosevelt Weaver. I don't know whatever happened to him, but I remember his name. And uh, I also was very lucky to get a hold of a guy who I don't remember his name, but he's a very famous guy. He was the, he, he, maybe you know his name. He was from Harvard. He uh, was a cultural advisor to the Cosby Show. His name began with A. He very cultured man. So we, these three people were going to give a talk. And uh, the, the man from Harvard gave a talk much like Manuel has given today. The Roosevelt Weaver gave a rebellious, you know, not going to put up a man and the change is going to come, you know, children are going to be different than parents, which is wild and crazy. And then it was talked by the editor of the Cape Verde magazine, a newspaper, who stood up and said, there is no racial problem in the United States. Thinking that there's no racial problem for Cape Verdeans, Cape Verdeans, but as soon as he got halfway through his speech, Roosevelt Lee threw a fit and said, you, you're an uncle called him an Uncle Tom, and uh, it would be super, super brutal, wild and crazy, and the guy from Harvard was going to count everybody down, Roosevelt was going to walk away, saying this is, we're throwing a cloak over the terrible problems in America. And needless to say, I wish I had never started this. <laughs> it seemed like a good idea at the time. But I'll never forget that. That, that here are people that came into, all people from outside of Situ, by the way. That was the first mistake I made. <laughs> they were all people from outside of Situ. I don't see, again, I'm maybe innocent, but I don't think the terminal was anywhere near as bad in Situ as it was out in the real world. And I think Situate has a, well, we're a far from perfect. I think we have a better uh, history of tolerance than the rest of the world. And uh, so I thought everything would go kindly, and it, and it certainly didn't. And it, it showed the, the difference between urban, blacks, uh, educate, uh, uh, the uh, academic uh, community, and the Portuguese community. 
the odd big kid pretty? I don't know what the answer was, but I knew that would like, cause an argument. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Matt, yeah, um, it, it, it depends. Uh, yeah, we, Good answer. <laughs> we have, we, have um, uh, we, we had relative uh, harmony uh, in Citra, most of us. Some have not. Um, some have not experienced uh, all of the uh, positive attributes. Um, and for me, growing up in Citra and then landing um, in Cambridge, going to school, it was like, wait a second. Because <laughs> that's where I got the questions. It was like, you're going to sit with us or you're going to sit with them? Or, so it is okay. So. Where, what happened to that? Where? So, anyways, it, right. and that's that every Cambrian in Sydney has gone on to college, and then many of them have experienced the same thing. We've held, we've led a sheltered existence here, um, and then, then it's it's really trying to have. Um, let, let me share this with the whole group. I'm not. Uh, they, there may be. Uh, a handful of Cape Britons in this room who's had all of the information about their history and background uh, condensed in some way where they can actually understand it from beginning to end. You know, Columbus discovered America, or we sent the man to the moon. You know, we, we, have, uh, we have a history that's there to be shared with, with the youth, and it's not being shared. And, that, and that's a responsibility that, you know, if we get to the next uh, slide, it's going to be, the school system needs to own up to the next step. Yeah. Yes? One other, um, other more thing for athletes, I live in Dorchester now, with um, I know a lot of people are in the And there's a group um, there that is starting to do a key learning theater, because they discovered and they even went back there to the grade school to have Dr. David and particular last name that I did not remember in the first name names that are that kind of nature or something like that. Yeah. More likely to be Jewish. Yeah. 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 We've had absolutely Rico and I are on the committee. How we can't read it. Because there's seven years. We've been to every year. Oh, okay. Yeah. And there, I met, I met the, uh, one of the directors of that program last year. There's actually a website you can visit with all of, all of this information about Jewish presence. There's a 501c3 uh, group out there uh, uh, dealing with people in the Jewish population. Going back, you know, pretty deep into our history. The students should be aware that our DNA shows that we all come from Africa, and we have to get that into the schools that the little ones know from the beginning from where we came. And just because we were a little bit, and not on part, we are a little bit lighter, but we are all coming from the same place. Um, there, I have a few more slides, I'll run through them and then we'll just open it up. John has uh, the PS or the smallest is going to be some uh, videos that he's taken recently. And hopefully show some of the uh, uh, modern, more modern uh, photographs of papers. So, questions? Yeah. Uh, we spoke about uh, Kate Murray being a photographer. Brazil, it's basically Brazil. Uh, what kind of a uh, settlement of Cape Verde do they have? Brazil. Uh, there are Cape Verdeans in Brazil. Um, <coughs> while Brazil became an independent nation <laughs> way early on, the Portuguese held on to Cape Verde, and Goa, Mozambique, Guinea Bissau, uh, Goa, Santa Barbara, and um, what's the one in uh, 
The government is more serious about kids going to school in Cape Verde. Uh, it's been, it was not the case with me. Uh, I was almost nine because there's a petition in, my parents had put in a petition for me to come to America when I was six. Six? Well, any day now it's coming. And, um, I was uh, eight and a half before the call came, so I missed out uh, a couple of years of education. Oh, miss it. Miss it. Uh, next slide. Um, is this the, this actually maybe the last slide? Uh, it is. So, the challenges. I guess more than social concerns, that now we probably have three sitting generations of, of Cape Verdeans uh, amongst us. We've got the early immigrations who are now in the elderly category. You've got the, the professionals who are some of the middle class, some not in the middle class. And now you've got these aspiring uh, young professionals or high school graduates. And it's, there are some issues bubbling. A lot of it has to do with uh, social services, whether it's in education, uh, health and dental, uh, whether it's dealing with some of the issues that still need to be resolved regarding um, um, acculturation or assimilation or engagement in the uh, uh, American community. Uh, you know, talk about mental health, don't talk about it. Because through the language of mental health, there is no language about mental health in the Cape Verdean mind. And that's where we're seeing so much um, uh, issue rising. It's how to even communicate to parents that there may be a mental health issue regarding family members or, or a child. It, it's, you, you can't even, you don't have, I don't know where you have to encounter that in school. Just kind of, you can't even find the right language to have some common understanding of what do you say and how do you treat it. You know? And how do you accept it? Because it was not anything dealt with properly in, in, in the The elderly population, um, those of us in this room are all in the middle of that sandwich. We are trying to figure out how to deal with uh, our children and our parents all at the same time. And uh, whatever you see going on in the general community is happening. There is an added pressure, though, in that um, in the uh, Cape Verdean community, there is no room. This is some room developing, but you don't put your parents in there. That's not why they put you on the surf. You take care of them until the day they die. Mother's 96 years old. She's still living in the house. She's actually doing quite well. She's 92. Mary Rose from Austin. Welcome. So, and you still have the language barrier. That is uh, a, a struggle, especially for some of the adults. So, uh, hopefully, those barriers will disappear uh, with the uh, younger Cambodians, but those who are uh, well on in, in life, it is very difficult to uh, make, you know, make that transition. So, I think I'm done. <laughs> so, so. If you have questions, uh, feel free.
as most of the Cape Verdeans here are either from Brava and Pogue, and I'm well kind of explained earlier why. As people leave, they kind of follow their families there. Early settlers came to Massachusetts, and all their relatives came here because they heard about Situ, or they heard about uh, Canton, Ohio, or they heard about the Cape Cod, or they heard about the Bedford. So that's, you kind of follow your family. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that, um, um, let me just wait for this here. The, on the island of Pool, because of the volcano and some of those islands, the beaches are very black. So it's a very contradiction between one island to the other. So without any further ado, let me go to the island of Pool. If I can get this alive. Are there any speakers for this? Are you speakers for this? Well, this has been uh, words with audio. No, no, no. I think I can do that. Yeah, in different places. These are typical housing. 
this is in right in Sanfili, down by the main area. The kids hang out there. Uh, some of the people might recognize some of their homes, some of their family homes here. Um, everything's basically uh, built of the Portuguese architecture. There's blocks, uh, very little wood, very little steel. Uh, they use the steel for the rebar and reinforcement more than anything else. Um, most houses will have a couple floors and you'll have balconies usually in the upper floor. Very secure in the rooms, most of the hotels, every room has a lock. I've never seen anything like that in my life. Every room you go in, you got a lock. You wonder why they want a lock, you in and lock you out. Um, but it's, it's typically that way. Most of the places, this is a little uh, right in downtown um, Vila, the capital. They have a little museum there that they're setting up with about uh, Cape Verde. There's the Black Beaches along there. This is right in the end in Vila, the capital. That was right at once when I guess that happened. Um, but again, after it rains, you see how green it can be. And again, my story, and I make up my stories. I was young in the world when I came. So I just kind of make up what happened. I think they arrived in August and they saw green as in Cape Verde. <laughs> they cool. uh, again, this is downtown in Vila. Just showing some of the people. And look at the complexions, like the wall says. There's a lot of variety in the shades. And in some places they're very white, you see green eyes, some places they're very dark. It's a very mixed community. Uh, you really don't talk about race that much, but even though they don't, there's still some places where the whiter you are, the more open you get, the more uh, benefits you get, which is really surprising because you know, I, I thought, I always tell everybody there's no racist, nothing can occur, but you'll still find it there. That's something that's all over the world. There's nothing you can really do about it. This is a typical annual thing that they do every year. They have this horse race through the town. I, I'm not particularly happy about it sometimes because they put sand on top, on top of the, the, the bricks and the blocks and all that, and the horses run. And every once in a while you see some injuries to the horses. But nevertheless, it's pilot culture and it's something that they do with their little horse races. This happens to be right outside of town. Uh, but sometimes they run right through the town, right through the center of the hills. Um, a, a lot of visitors there, a lot of Europeans. Um, this particular island of Polk, again, that's where most of our family come. Less uh, land is, is purchased by the Europeans, but there's a lot of them there, and they are buying them, and you can start seeing some of the influence. Since it was one of the later ones that the, the Europeans started going to, they got a little bit smarter about selling their property and selling their land. Up in, in the north, in uh, Sal, there's a story about a man who sold uh, this land for $50,000. He thought he was rich. He thought this was the end of the world. And about five years later, that same man who bought it sold it for $5 million. And it just gives you an idea of how little we understood the value of our land. In that same place now, there's a multi, I'd say $500 million hotel that I've built over there, Rui Hotel. And, and again, one of the bad features of, of what the Europeans have done is you'll see no Cape Verdeans in that hotel. It's all Europeans. Uh, even the workers, they bring their cooks, they bring their, sh their, their, their workers, they bring in, and then you'll see Cape Verdeans watering the lawn or taking care of some of the loose, you know, some of the odds and ends outside. You really don't see that, um, you really don't see them participate in the benefits that the hotel has brought to the country. Um, the government, uh, again, you know, for their benefit in order to bring some of that money into the country, they gave a lot of a lot of uh, benefits, a lot of um, uh, incentives to bring the Europeans in. And whenever I speak to them about, you know, hey, you got to stop them. Well, they really did that because they couldn't get the Americans and they couldn't get us to invest over there. Us, the Cape Verdeans, come over here, make money. We wouldn't go back. So the Europeans started doing it. 
and that's kind of opened up the, the, the roadblocks, and now they're tightening up some of those benefits and stuff, a lot of things that they're allowing them to do. Now you want to build a hotel, well, you have to have a desalination plant to produce your own water, you have to have a power plant a lot of times to produce your own electricity, you have to take care of your waste, you have to do all these things. So they've learned from that, and now they're making to spend a little bit more. Again, I'm talking about a lot of other stuff, but you'll see these houses, like I well, said 35 years ago, a lot of these houses look exactly identical. Um, I have a lot of photos of some of the new places, but uh, you know, maybe I'll just stop talking and let you watch the video. <coughs> Coffee. Uh, our family has a lot of land over there that throws a coffee that with, I'm trying to clear up some issues. Not my immediate family, but some of my relatives trying to clear up some issues with who actually owns the land so we can have some access to that. Grapes. This is a good shot. Um, you know, you see from the mountains, the, the grapes go just about everywhere. One of the top wine producers in full is our first cousin. He actually calls the wine. He actually calls the wine the chop. Um, you know, being in the chop. And my father was actually going to help them, you know, get the money to, to uh, sell them the farms and all that. That little hotel still exists. Exists. Excuse me. Um, it's only got about 12 rooms, and it's mainly used by the hikers. They come in, they'll, uh, you know, it's very cheap. They might get up for like $30 a night, and then they hike up to the top of the volcano. Uh, some friends, I've never done it. Some friends of mine were up there the other day, and they said it took them four hours to go up and one hour to come down. So it must have really ran on that. I've never done it. Yeah, uh, well, they couldn't stop. Uh, <laughs> but it, it is really the views are just absolutely out of this world. But you'll see a lot of Europeans come here. Um, you know, and you just see the, the, the pictures here, and they just love it. Everybody who goes to full goes up to chat. Uh, uh, just just add a uh, quick note here. I don't know if any of you guys know the Kios in town. Kio, K E H O E. How many Kio? Okay. His uh, niece uh, teaches uh, Cape Breton students in Boston. And she spent uh, a month in Cape Breton this summer, and she didn't want to get on the plane to come back. So she's now planning to go back and uh, work with the uh, University of Cape Breton. These are some of the little crafts that the people, you're still going up to the village, they'll still stop you and try to sell you different things. They make them out of the, the, uh, the chocolate, uh, what is it, volcanic ash or whatever. Uh, I actually know some of these people that they, they show here. These are actually, um, these two little kids here, that's a Tiago's stepchildren. My first has a stepchildren. There's a guy here who's playing the, 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 the music. His name is Juan. And um, he knew my father growing up. I got a whole video of him talking about my father. Um, <laughs> what was that? <laughs> They're talking about a drink with sulfur. Yeah. <laughs> this kid here is Michelle. I, I claim that I just love him. He's got a great voice, great ability with the, with the guitar. Self-taught. Never had an education in music. Anywhere you go down there now, you'll find him playing in different places. Michelle. The rich paper in music that you hear, 95% are from self-taught musicians. And some of the uh, some of the things I didn't include in the slide, I had another 20 slides, and take a more to uh, There are two, uh, some of you will remember the Gavaris group. Uh, 
They are key for the industry. The reason why we now have a name is the Turnpikes contain great musicians. The Mendes Brothers and the Brockton, great musicians. Cezania Evra, unfortunately, passed away recently. And she became the Cape Barefoot Diva found by the uh, French. And you know, she's not uh, any, any nightclub, any coffee, uh, cafe, you know, to her music, some of that. But it all comes from self self-conscious musicians. I just want to show some pictures of, uh, of Sal, which is a total contradiction. I can't seem to figure out where it is. I'm all over. I think this is brown. No, this is this is Santiago. So I don't want to show you that. Let's see if I can find. And while he looks for that, um, mm -hmm. I was wondering the, the Independence Day party. Could you give us a quick quick synopsis of how? Sure. Sure. The um, some of you heard, heard the name Amelia Cabral. I'm uh, looking around, Pedro uh, Quiroz, Estiz Pereira, uh, Manuel, Silvino, Danuiz, a ton of people in the community. They, there was an armed struggle in uh, Guinea Bissau, there's an armed struggle going on in Mozambique and Angola against the Portuguese. From like the late 50s, um, right through the 60s, into the 70s. It became such a difficult issue for the uh, Portuguese. It became their Vietnam. They were fighting wars in places where they didn't know who the guerrillas were, etc. The uh, there is the party that PAIGC. I don't remember. Ricky did when you get a chance. Put up our flag. The flag there. The, there is a a African group or a group called. The African Party for the Independence of Guinea and Calpere, they led the armed struggle in Guinea. Um, in 1974, the Portuguese generals basically said, you know, we're, this is useless, you're taking uh, valuable resources that need to go to Portuguese people in Portugal is spending in a useless war. Something like Vietnam. So anyways, the generals are through the um, uh, dictators, Salazar. They were approved and they worked out the arrangements and parceled out independence in, in a guided schedule. Uh, supervised by the United Nations. So, Ricky, I can give you more some other time. Is that the flag? That's the flag. That is the flag of the, uh, and you see the African flag. Now, this, this is one of the toughest things to accept. Uh, when uh, Ben and I uh, got into the program, we, we bought flags. We wanted to bring the flags to your flags. So, this is the flag of Cape Verde at the time of independence. I think it was 1991 or so. There was another election. The um, MPD party, Democratic Party, got to go to the standpoint. The movement that I put it, not in the Anyway, that party won, and they brought their flag. <laughs> so, next slide. Uh, so, this is, I think they resolved, this is the flag, and uh, it's sort of modeled on the U.S. flag. And then I know it's the flag, whatever. So. Anyway, so that's uh, where you are going to put it So, you, what do you feel about the flag? Uh, porn. No, it's, uh, what can you do? Uh, so, you, I have both flags. Now, who's that both flag? <laughs> they changed. I don't think, no, but it was a change. It's now, uh, the, uh, the first flag didn't get changed. Well, when I made the poster, I saw that flag, and that's why I used those colors. Yeah, that's the right one. Okay.
that's the uh, may not the, be the PC thing to do, but it's the right thing. This, this is the island of Saab, and you'll see the contradiction in the, the, the topography, the landscape, everything that goes on. Um, the beautiful, beautiful beaches, the, 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 I don't know if this was staged or not, but you see the white, white beach, and it's like that in the northern islands, Gold Vista and Saab. I looked into this thing, the top 10 hundred beaches of the world that wasn't on there. And I just laughed because I said, they have seen Bo Vista. This year I heard it's in there. Okay, because I haven't seen it myself. Because people, once they discovered it, the Europeans, it's just amazing how beautiful the country is. Um, so this, this is just to show you. Um, you Sal stands for Sal. That's what you point the whole thing. They used, to have, they used to have some of the biggest salt mines in the world. Now they don't even pull salt out of there. They use that air. In fact, this is one of the salt mines here. You go there more for sightseeing, going to some of the caves. Uh, there's some, you know, puddles where you can go swimming. It's just really, you know, it's just really beautiful. Okay, really, it's made up of 10 items. Now, is there a capital? Yes, the capital is Granada, and that's on the main island of Santiago. Half of the bad, half the population is on the main this, this is some recent stuff the Europeans built in Granada. I stayed in that place over there. The Catholic uh, Church was a major player in the development of Cape Verde. It, it was in partnership with the Portuguese government to provide basic education. I think even until, uh, I don't know if it's been dropped out of the magazine. We have a professor from Ridgemar in the back here. <laughs> Stand up. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, Lydia. And she, she's involved with uh, a, a, a lot of what she's doing. Oh, again, I, I wasn't going to show you all this. I just wanted to show you. All right. Don't show the piano, man. I just wanted to show you uh, the, the different pages, so you want to. Okay. All right. Um, well, I got a couple of things we've got to do before you go. Um, one of the problems with people when we talk about history, we talk about the colonial times. In fact, history is what happened yesterday. And history is what happened in every family. And in all our families, your families and mine, we didn't think we were important enough to really write down the history. We, we kept it amongst ourselves, talked to each other about it, but we never wrote anything down. Because, I was talking to Manuel about this, it's the great theme of who do you think you are? And you say there's a Cape expression for that. Yeah. And this attitude of who do you think you are, you're not important enough to have your own personal history. It, it gets worse. Uh, who do you think you are means who do you think you are trying to get A's and B's in, in, in high school? Who do you think you are to aspire to go to college? That who do you think you are idea is a, a, a terrible idea and I, I hope we can put it into it. And one of the things that sort of applies to this is the pictures of people whose names have been lost. There's a, pic, there's a fabulous picture, you have to see this before you go, this picture of the Cape Verdean Society that met right here, right in the spot where I'm standing. And there's a lot of faces that everybody knows, and there's many faces that we don't. The, the one person who we really don't know who it is, is this person. And if anybody knows, if anybody has an idea, please share it. This is a, a famous photograph taken by hand on me for a 1938 Life magazine article of uh, uh, town meeting in situ. And that was one of the few real close up pictures. And we don't know who it is. And so if anybody knows, let us know. 
and uh, please share your history with us. What was the date of that? That's 1938. The picture up here is 1939. So we can't find the same faces in it, but we saw we have some of them. Connie has some of the people in this thing, and you must see it. That one of the people in it is a uh, teacher that I had in school, and about the only and Alpha, I remember Alpha, but uh, that's about the only two people that I remember. But please come by and look at that. Um, any other comments? I just wanted to get that in, but I didn't want to step on the Oh, what about the yeah, the historical, the history of the historical society certainly wants to know. Um, the, the old pilgrims were never hesitant to keep their genealogies and share them with the world. And uh, it seems like us, the Irish and the, and the uh, Cape Verdeans, keep it to themselves. I think we need that information for people who want to find out. Since it's, it's a key uh, feature in the Cape Verdean family, We've got to keep that information alive so that the people from Brockton or Canton, Ohio, or places like that can come back here and find out who their who their people were that came before them. It, it's an amazing thing to look into genealogy. To not only do we find the pirates and the criminals and the murderers in our background, we also find the great successes in our background. And we, it's, it's okay to take pride in your heritage because everybody has the similar heritage. Everybody has a background that has pirates and murderers and college professors and doctors and wonderful people. You've got to find that out. The only way to find it out is to keep track of it. And so please share that information with us in the historical society. And don't be a stranger. Um, don't be subject to the who do you think you are right now. Uh, please come in. You're as good as anybody else. So we want to hear them. Uh, but you had questions for Manuel and uh, maybe you can step up. Can the lights go on? Yeah. yeah. Do you have a question? In, with all the years of drought, how were they able to build the hotels and the high rise? Well, right now, again, when, if you want to come there and build, build a development, you need to make sure you can sustain electricity, water, sewage, everything. So the government's telling them you have to provide that all part of what you're doing. So when they go over there, they have desalination plants for building. They have uh, uh, water treatment plants. They have sewer treatment plants. They have power plants. Wind is a big thing. Uh, there's a group of us trying to get waste of energy over there. Um, they're trying, you know, there's, they're making you as part of your development. You need to bring that technology with you. Technology is there, so that's what the Europeans are doing now. Is they're, they're building it as part of their development. So you're saying that uh, in, in any hotel that goes up to a swimming pool, you've got showers, etc. They built their own desalinization. Yes, figure out where to get the money. Yeah, you you need to provide all the services. If you don't have it, then you're not going to get your permits. Some of the smaller hotels, you know, will use the town, uh, the city water, the city electricity. But when they lose power, they lose everything. When the water goes bad, they lose their water. Um, you know, so you'll have a lot of that. But all the lives you have to provide that stuff as well. Scott. Um, is before you speak, Bob and I are classmates. <laughs> I haven't seen him in how many years? Quite a while. Yeah. Is Creole a written language or is it spoken? Creole. Creole, Creole is a written language. Uh, the, uh, it was a forbidden language. Okay. And in, uh, it was yeah. forbidden by the Portuguese in any formal communication was forbidden in school in Cape in Verde because that was part of the colonialist control. Can, can, can I say, can I add something to that? I, I want to add two things. First of all, uh, it was verbal until Manuel and the Google guys put it in writing back in the late 70s, early 70s. 1970. Yeah, of course. So up until then, it wasn't written, okay? But the other thing I want to ask, and again, this is my piece of disclosure history, 
a Creole. This was the original Creole. It was Cape Verdean Creole. And it started with the slaves in Ciudad de Verde, which is where they did all the slave trades and all that. And it was the way that they communicated with each other so the Portuguese didn't understand what they were saying. And it was actually, that's where the word Creole came from. You have the Spanish Creole down in, in New Orleans and all that, but the original Creole came from Cape Verde. So, uh, because of this, how much of your history is oral as opposed to written? Well, right now, uh, there is a lot written. There's a lot written in Portuguese that have been translated to uh, uh, English. The, I mean, I have, uh, there are several books that I, uh, I've given the names of it in the sheet that you have. Those are generally available books. But there, there's a lot more. There's a, a book by Antonio Carreira that goes back to 1500s and talks about. I have, you know, with that a slide, I have 18 slides that were provided. The history of Cape Verde was French and description. There is an outline there. Uh, a friend of mine uh, who excuse me. Ray Almeida passed away two years ago. Um, but he has online a chronology of paper in history. That if this is something that interests you, it is the greatest way to get to help us um, um, the slavery uh, um, issues, it help us the timeline for American presence, British presence, uh, covers the timeline for the whale is there. Uh, the first in connection with what was going on there and here. It's, it's a mar marvelous 20 page quick hit. A lot of it's in Yes. Um, George Thomas, um, this is the cruise all the and I don't understand what you said. Speaking of what is they speak, you know, Creole or what? They're speaking Creole. That's absolutely yeah. Right. yeah. And some, you know, some of the people here know who they are. Yeah. My mother knows who they are. <laughs> yeah. My mother knows uh, who, who those who are. Every oppressed people have a language of their own. The Irish have a that which the British couldn't understand. And uh, that's the first place you start is to be able to speak to each other and so people can't understand what you say. I don't I don't want to leave here. Uh, I don't like to correct my own family <laughs> Some of the original uh, thinking on this subject also has a sh maybe uh, uh, I don't know maybe it's not in the room she may not. But the um, one of the interpretations of the uh, genesis of that language is that um, the uh, Portuguese masters needed to communicate with the slaves. So they took the language and minimum, minimalized it so that you didn't have to say, that's why um, some of us talk it monosyllabically so, so or you know, just say uh, cheese, and that's supposed to mean bring me a piece of Swiss cheese. <laughs> so, anyways. Yeah, the other thing you told about the Creole language is it changes from island to island. So, so in some islands it phases Portuguese, some islands it goes away from it. So when I'm there, I can't speak to the people in the north and understand them easily. Yet I go to full and I can speak to everybody. A lot, of it, a lot of it is dialectical, not necessarily linguistic. Yeah, but some people say that, for example, in some people in some town, there are more connections between England and uh, Brazil and Argentina and so you know they have different words for the Jews for a lot of their languages down there. And if, for example, you say for to speak is Papia, Fra, Pala, Pla, Ze. You know, this is all the same word. And so, you know, I had a chance you know, to be in the different islands. So. But that's the same in the United States. I, I don't like to 
just because you have multiple words for the same thing, it doesn't necessarily differentiate you. But just because you have a richer language, you can choose to uh, bigger words or smaller words to say the same thing. Other questions? Funny story. Uh, somebody asked me who the migrant workers were in my field one day. And I just laughed at them. I said, well, they migrated all the way from Boston. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. Just make sure that I have the green papers. <laughs> yeah, I have the green papers. Does it go back? I guess a lot of people go back to Titles in the wintertime and they spend all the money they got on their panels. Yeah. And they come back and they work at the sales office and then they go back. Yeah. Well, talk, talk about frugality. Yeah. Um, you know, you're not, you know, they're not there working to make a hundred bucks a week to go spend it in a nice meal at a restaurant. Yeah. They work hard. They're working hard. They're yeah. saving yeah. money. Yeah. Oh, yeah? They don't want their cut sheet then. Do you guys see that? Yeah. Uh, remind me again, you, you're with some of this time? No, I think we're going to stick with John. Okay. And uh, I, it would not be uh, proper not to uh, mention a couple of the uh, Major employers that help keep earnings above and beyond what they um, uh, could have. And that's an Alan Wheeler because, and Ann Wheeler were not just providing jobs to keep earnings, but I remember going with my father when we were doing the fishing for my uh, uncles to come to America. I would go and say, we need an offer of employment in order for us to submit the applications. And there are five of them. And Anne just sat there and wrote out five letters saying, you can put, you can attach this with your application. If they come, there's a job, there's a job. If there isn't, we'll help them find another job elsewhere. And for the most part, he hired. Them. So, so those employers, you know, in, uh, people like uh, Alfred Gomes spent uh, a lot of his own time. You know, I remember when we arrived, he ensured that the Catholic Church knew they were there. He ensured that St. Vincent de Paul Society knew we had just arrived. Uh, he, I, I think Connie may have covered this, but he ensured that uh, we were able to um, um, properly outfit the house with new beds or used beds, whatever it is, but just make sure there's a refrigerator there. So it's just they really went above and beyond to uh, get you off to a good start. But as the tradition evolved, um, at least in the 60s, early 70s, what um, I witnessed happening was that the um, elders, whenever you arrived, you would basically go from uh, elder to elder in town. And they'd all give you 20 bucks, 40 bucks, 50 bucks. Not to go below somewhere that says, this is to get you started. And if they did well, uh, there was probably a chance they'd get more. If they took that money and, and blew it on a wild car, again, <laughs> they'll never come uh, to Tony, isn't that true? Yes, completely true. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Kenny Goldston was a great employer. Did you mention Boston Center? Uh, I didn't go into that. Yeah. I mean, um, the Boston Center and a lot of people. Yes. Thomas Lawson, uh, that's the Boston right. in the States. Uh, I'm the eye for that. Somebody was telling me. Somebody was telling me that. Um, when Thomas Lawson lost his fortune, I think, I can't remember Mr. Chase's name, I remember they were Chase by the end of the time. Well, Mr. Chase bought some of the property that Lawson owned in the Egypt area of Pleasant Street in the Atlanta Road. He often was a kid with men to buy the land. They said no because they plan on going back home when they retired. But as it was, most of them stayed here and died here. But they did buy lots of women for $200 each, and they built homes. But that uh, land was set aside.
the other thing about uh, Thomas Lawson, uh, again, for being repetitive, I apologize. Uh, the, um, it is, I, I remember reading that I couldn't locate it and say the thing I used. This is what happened, is that Thomas Lawson um, actually uh, sent um, his vessel back and forth to Cape Verde to pick up Cape Verde, live on the land, live in housing that was provided, teach the makers, and allow them to, uh, not allow them, but hire them to uh, take care of his uh, property. So that's something I'd like to, I'd like to find in hard print and that uh, it would be nice to document that. That's, the, that's what everybody said. That's what everybody said. Yeah. 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 I have a question. Um, yeah. Yeah. See, uh, Lawson, he um, taught, he had the um, Italian some over. He set up a lending library and a school teacher for them to teach them English. Did he do the same thing in the I don't, I don't know that. I'm, I'm, that's a chapter I'm missing. I will tell you, Susan, when Susan and I were in, in uh, Milwaukee, we went into uh, a, uh, Art Museum, and we're, you know, we're walking around, and there was this big black uh, uh, mural, I guess. Empty frame. Em empty frame. And, and it was Thomas Lawson. So I, I was looking for stuff in town, so I ran to it and said, Wow, it, it was Thomas Lawson from Century, and this is out of nowhere. It was just a frame. It's just the frame. So the one with the bulldogs on it? With the bulldogs on it. I saw that. I touched it. That was our best close to touch. That was not a funny graph. It was the big frame. Probably the best frame maker ever in the United States. Yeah. They caused a question just a little bit fast. I think it was Goldley for a long time. It was. Yeah. It was good. He has a uh, chest in the new wing of the museum of fine eyes, frame gas. It's a big mm -hmm. chest. Yeah. Do you have a picture of this frame? Yeah. Huh? Do you have a picture of this frame? You know yes, I do. Well, can I? Well, I did. So I have. So. I, I can send it to you. I have. Oh, good. Uh, yeah. Okay. I sent it to the librarian. They cut the whole box out and say. Yeah. I <laughs> did. <laughs> but on the frames, I have the book. Right. Well, where? Any more questions? Well, thank you very much for coming. Don't forget to see the picture.